Hello and welcome to webinar three of the Why Rethinking Pain Really Matters series. Towards the end of the event, you will hear a reference to a questionnaire evaluation and your feedback is really important to us. It's how we get to understand what is helpful, what isn't and what we can do better. That survey is still live and we would really appreciate if you could spend five minutes to complete it. You will find the link below this video and also via the QR code on the screen now. If you hover your phone camera over the QR code, it will take you straight to it. Thanks again and enjoy the webinar. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Flipping Everything You Thought You Knew About Arthritis. My name is Felicity Thau and I'm a member of the Flipping Pain team. Flip and Pain is a public health campaign aimed at improving understanding of persistent pain. And this is the third and final event in our Rethinking Pain series funded by NHS Scotland. This event is being recorded and it will be emailed to you afterwards. It will also be available as usual on our YouTube channel if you'd like to share it afterwards. This afternoon's event is all about arthritis and we're delighted and also very fortunate to be able to have Professor Tasha Stanton from the University of South Australia to present for us today. Tasha works at the forefront of arthritis research, so get your questions ready for her. This afternoon's event will be followed by the presentation will be followed by a question and answer session where we'll also be joined by Celia and John from Scotland, who both live with persistent pain themselves, healthcare professionals, uh, Greg Nicholl, a GP, and Alistair Murray, an orthopaedic surgeon with an extended, uh, a GP with an extended role in orthopaedics, rather, will also be here to answer your questions. There is, in terms of housekeeping, you can answer your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll see on your screen. We'll put those to our panellists at the end of the session. Uh, your cameras will be switched off so we can't see you and you'll, you'll be on uh, mute for the duration of the presentation. Unfortunately, we can't offer any personalised medical advice and you'll also notice a new feature from today that we have a, an accessibility feature whereby you can add captions in a, a variety of different languages at the bottom of your screen. So you may have heard this before at Flip and Pain uh, and our events, but I think it's worth repeating. In case you've ever been made to feel otherwise, we'd like to acknowledge that persistent pain is real, it's complex and it's often distressing. It can make us feel scared, angry, anxious, depressed, isolated and ultimately not in control. Sadly, there's a lot of misinformation out there and that can increase that feeling. So our aim today is to share with you the most accurate information that there is so that you can feel in control again. Some of this information may be completely different to what you've heard before. It may even make you feel uncomfortable. What we also know is what you hear today won't make your pain disappear completely, immediately but it may start you on the right path to reclaiming back your life and reclaiming you. And so I'm delighted to introduce Professor Tasha Stanton with her presentation. Over to you, Tasha, in Australia. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited to get to join you all today. And good afternoon in Scotland. It's evening here, but, but that works. Um, I'm really excited to get to talk to you today about arthritis. And in my talk, you're going to hear me focusing on knee osteoarthritis because that's the area that I specialize in. But know that if you have arthritis in other areas of your body, all of the information that I'm going to talk about today is relevant to you as well. So before I begin, I just want to start um, by acknowledging that today I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the Kana people um, from Adelaide, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to just talk over briefly what my disclosures are, because I think that's really important for you to know who I am and where I come from. So I receive payment for lectures like this on pain and rehabilitation. And I've also written a book on osteoarthritis um, and I receive royalties for this. And some of the information from this book I'm going to be sharing with you today. But rest assured, this is some of the newest knowledge that's out there for osteoarthritis. So let's get cracking. So the medical community, you know, we thought that we knew everything about osteoarthritis. We know what it is, we can easily diagnose it, and we know what to treat it. 
you know, we know it's this degenerative joint disease. And thank goodness, if we send you into a scanner, we can actually see it. We know how to diagnose this, diagnose it. But and also if we if we look to how to treat it, typically what we think is, well, you know, we can get people going all right. We can keep them active. We can help them keep weight off to, you know, reduce the load that is going through that damaged joint. And we can do our very best to keep them healthy. But ultimately, sooner or later, it's going to get worse and everyone is going to need um, a joint replacement. We're going to need to remove that damaged knee and replace it with a bright, shiny new one. But do we know this? Is this true? Well, let's even just look at one aspect of that. If it is true, you know, all of this, if we were just to remove your knee and give you a new one, that should mean that joint replacements cure everyone. And yet, if we look into the literature, what we see is that the outcomes of joint replacements are not as good as we might think, particularly when we talk in depth to patients that have undergone this procedure. So for example, if we look at people, um, this is from very high level evidence from big reviews, after a joint replacement, about 10 to 34% of people have unfavorable long-term pain outcomes. So that's as many as three of every 10 people don't have great pain outcomes after a joint replacement. And 15% still report having moderate to severe pain two to five years after surgery. So that's moderate to severe pain in a knee that's no longer there. That's interesting, isn't it? So it's relevant, you know, to have a bit of a look at what people with osteoarthritis believe and what they've been told. And really, it actually aligns very closely with that, that story that I told you before, that medical understanding in that they believe strongly that their osteoarthritis is due to what we call wear and tear. So the joint has worn out and ultimately that's caused damage to the joint, meaning that the more you use it, the more I might lose it. They also hold strong beliefs that the reason they have pain is because their cartilage is gone. Their joint is bone on bone. And together with this wear and tear process in this bone on bone joint, that results in this vulnerable joint. Um, they also report strong beliefs that that joint will continue to deteriorate over time. And this combination of my joint is going to get worse and it's vulnerable means that there are really large impacts on what they think that they should do with their osteoarthritis. So for example, for many people, there will be avoidance of different activities because it's, you think, well, actually, if I have this wear and tear joint that's damaged, I don't want to load my knee anymore. That could just do more damage. And, you know, I, I, I know exercise might work for some people, but not for me because I don't have any cartilage left. I need to replace that cartilage. So for me, surgery is the only option. And this, this might sound familiar to you. When we look also a little bit closer at people's beliefs about exercise, this is what we hear from people with osteoarthritis. It seems like common sense that if you've got a deterioration in the joint, like which arthritis is, the more you do, the more it's gonna be worn, you know? I wouldn't have thought it's something that would get better with practice, you know, with exercise. Or someone else has said, if it's your bones that's grating together, causing that much pain because there's wear and tear, how are the muscles above or below really going to help? And the thing is, those are completely valid statements, aren't they? Why should exercise help a joint like this? And I would argue that advice to move and an advice to exercise for arthritis makes absolutely no sense unless one first understands that osteoarthritis is not a wear and tear disease of the joint. Because ultimately, that is what the science is showing us. 
So when we look back at these things that people with osteoarthritis have been told, and you may well have been told very similar things from the health professionals that you've seen, and that may have formed really strong beliefs, what we see is that when we look to the science, these are actually myths and misperceptions. So what I'd like to do with you today is I want to do a bit of myth busting. I want to tackle one of the big ones, and that's that myth of wear and tear. So the idea behind this, this of course, is the more that we wear something that's damaged, the more that, that it becomes worn out. And many people with arthritis may have been told, and this might be you included, that actually, you know, you want to lose weight because then there'll be less load and force through your joints, those damaged vulnerable joints. And if you lose weight, then actually that reduces the force in it and it can help and make things better. Let's, let's examine and investigate that myth. Because what we see when we look to the science is that weight matters, but it's not how you might think. So if you have higher body weight, but it's due to higher levels of body fat. This is associated with reduct or an increased cartilage loss over time. So with a progression of osteoarthritis. But if you have higher body weight, but it's due to more muscle, more muscle mass, that is not associated with a progression of osteoarthritis. In fact, it's associated with maintaining knee cartilage levels over time. So what this tells us is that it's not extra body weight that's contributing to a progression of osteoarthritis. It's actually extra body fat. And we see evidence that supports this because having higher levels of body fat or obesity predicts progression of hand osteoarthritis, which of course is a non-weight bearing joint. So there's no, no reason that, that weight should influence how much that joint hurts. So the available evidence suggests that, or does not support this idea that wear equals tear. Instead, what we're actually starting to understand is that having extra fat or higher levels of obesity actually contributes to inflammatory responses in osteoarthritis. And those inflammatory responses can change progression of osteoarthritis and also how much pain you feel. And I'm going to come back to this idea um, in a little bit. So a second part of this wear and tear myth is this idea that, OK, once my joint gets really worn and I have, you know, I have no really poor cartilage or no cartilage left, I'm in trouble because if I do more, I'm just going to wreck it further. Um, and it, my joint is actually really vulnerable if I load it and do more activity. So this, this is, is, a, is something that is presuming that what you have in terms of cartilage is the best it's ever going to be. It's only ever going to get worse. But this is another myth. Because if we look to the literature, if we look to the science, what we see is that cartilage, it's not static. It's dynamic and it can change in a good way. So it actually loves loading. So if we look at astronauts who go to space, they're in microgravity. They have absolutely no loading on that joint. And yet when they come back to Earth, their cartilage is thinner. And it's less healthy. So when you have the absence of loading through the joint, your cartilage does worse. And if we look at the opposite extreme and we look at marathon runners, the people that we might call the ultimate wear and tearers, they're putting so much load and force through their joints as they train and they and they compete in races. And what we actually see is that marathon runners have thicker cartilage, more healthy cartilage than people who, who don't um, don't do exercise. And what's intriguing is if we follow, you know, the really crazy ultra marathon runners who do these like enormously long races, if we follow them over time, their knee cartilage actually adapts during the race. So it's already adapting to the forces that are occurring while they're running. That's incredible, isn't it? And the fact that cartilage can change for good and that loading can help actually makes sense when we look back at the physiology or what goes on in cartilage. Because 
actually, I'm not sure if you know this, but the cartilage, that, that um, tough layer that lines your bones, it doesn't have a blood supply. So it actually gets its nutrients through compression and load. So through things like activity and movement. And what's more is you have these specialized cells in your cartilage and they're called chondrocytes and they're important ones. They make aspects of the cartilage called collagen that keeps it strong and agrican that keeps things uh, sticky and, and held together. And chondrocytes love loading. It's actually loading that makes what we call daughter cells. So they have these parts of chondrocytes that they go out to other areas of the joint and they help repair cartilage. So I would argue that the available evidence from science suggests not that cartilage wears and tears, but that cartilage can wear and repair. So you might be thinking though, well, okay, that's great that cartilage is, you know, it, 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 can, it can get better, it can improve, but it still hurts when I'm moving, when I'm walking, when I'm exercising. Isn't that telling me that actually I am doing more damage or, or not doing something good for my joint if it's hurting? Because if cartilage loves loading so much, why does it hurt when I move? And there's a good reason for that. And we're starting to understand that this is because there are changes to the nervous system when you have osteoarthritis that mean that the system itself is overprotective. So a bit like this, this cat here who has seen a, a cucumber and having a really big response, we see that the system in osteoarthritis is overprotective. So for example, um, if we compare people who have osteoarthritis to people who don't, um, they're generally more sensitive. So if we test how much pressure we apply to an area of the body before it hurts, People with painful knee osteoarthritis are more sensitive. It takes less pressure for it to hurt. Those are the red bars there. Then at all areas of their body, at the knee, at the thumb, at the, the trapezius muscle up here on, by your neck, they're more sensitive regardless of the location. So why? And to answer this question, we need to take a step back and just review how our pain system works. So when we injure ourselves, so in this case, we've stepped on a thumbtack, we know that there are specialized receptors um, called nociceptors or danger detectors that activate. Um, and you have these same danger detectors uh, in your knee or in any joint, and they can activate um, when uh, you, you have arthritic changes in that joint. So you have an activation of these danger detectors that sends a message up a nerve to your spinal cord, talks to a different nerve, goes up your spinal cord, talks to another area, and then goes out to the brain. And one of the things that we've started to understand, I would say over the last 10 to 15 years, maybe longer, is a really important thing. And it's that the message that's going up to the brain, well, it's tempting to think that it's a signal of pain. It's not. What that message is from the danger detectors, it's a signal of danger or threat. And that signal of danger or threat that's coming from your body has to be taken into account with all the other things that's going, that are going on around for you in your environment and at that time. And ultimately, it's determining, do I need to be protected? And if you need to be protected, pain is a great way to do it. Creating pain is perfect because it actually stops you from doing silly things. It, it makes us change what we do. So in fact, that danger signal is it's important, but it's one of many things that can contribute to an experience of pain. But I do want to focus now for the next little bit on what happens to that danger signal in people with osteoarthritis and why that, that can contribute to things being oversensitive. So um, I mentioned this earlier, but what we're understanding is that osteoarthritis invo involves increased body-wide levels of inflammation. And so when we talk about inflammation, it's kind of like what happens when you get the flu. You don't feel great, you're sluggish, you're, you're sore, you might experience pain. Um, and typically when we have low levels of inflammation, we don't always notice it. We might just feel a bit off. 
Um, but that's what we have in osteoarthritis is are these really low level uh, in, uh, increases in inflammation. But this happens in osteoarthritis, this, this increase in inflammation for a lot of different reasons. And the first is, is that as we get older, we do tend to have higher levels of what we call systemic or body-wide inflammation. It just seems to happen as we get older. But also when we have higher levels of body fat, that adipose tissue that's in body fat it can produce something that's called adipokines. And that's just a fancy word for a molecule that basically increases inflammation. And not only that, when we have osteoarthritis, and particularly if there are higher levels of body fat and we're not moving as much and we're not eating as well, there can be changes to the gut microbiome. So all the things that live in your intestines and that actually can communicate with your bloodstream and can increase levels of inflammation. So we have this higher level of inflammation in people with osteoarthritis, and that has important sequelae or important impact on what happens with that danger signal. So let's say coming from your sore knee, there's normally a danger signal that's that big as indicated by that arrow. Now, without any changes to your joint at all, um, when you have presence of inflammation, what happens is, the danger detectors in your joint are more sensitive. It's easier to activate them. And not only that, is when there's inflammation, they bring in extra friends. So um, th with the same uh, stimulus, with the same you know, force going through your joint, more danger detectors activate. So what that means is, without any difference to the knee at all, when there is inflammation, that danger signal goes from this to this. And a very similar thing happens at the spinal cord. So when that danger message is going up to the spinal cord, when there's inflammation, it's more sensitive and it brings in extra friends. Meaning that with no difference in the knee at all, but in the pre presence of inflammation, the danger signal goes from this to this. And that's transmitted up to the brain. So ultimately, we've gone from a danger signal like this size to this size merely because there's inflammation there. And we know that there's also additional things that can occur once that signal is up to the brain that mean it is heightened even further. So right away, we can see that there's changes that mean the, the pain system itself is more sensitive. But it's not only that, because all of us actually will experience something like this. If we sprain an ankle, our systems, inflammation will kick in and we will experience something like this where everything is sensitized and heightened. But part of our pain system is the fact that it can react to stuff like that. So we actually have what we call brakes and accelerators of our nervous system that can deal with sensitivity. So the brain actually talks to the spinal cord and it can change or modify how sensitive everything is. So it can either um, make things less sensitive, so the brakes can be put on, or the accelerator can be pressed and makes everything more sensitive. So when it's less sensitive, it's harder for a danger signal to get up and it's smaller. When it's more sensitive, it's easier for that danger signal to get up and it's bigger. Now here's the thing. In people with osteoarthritis, what we see is that the brakes are impaired. They're not working like they should be. So it, they're about 50% um, uh, less functional than people who don't have osteoarthritis. So it means we can't reduce the sensitivity of the system. But it's not only that. We also see that the accelerator is working too well, about 80% too well. So taken together, we get this situation where things are way more sensitive. So these changes to the neuroimmune system in people with painful osteoarthritis, they're a little bit like road rage, but when you are starving hungry. I want you to think about driving your car and getting cut off. Someone pulls in front of you and it's, it's not fun, is it? It it's, can be scary. You're a bit annoyed. You're like, that wasn't safe. I mean, I, I could have hit you. I don't, could have hurt you. Anyways, you're, you're annoyed. But 
if you are starving hungry, what's that response like? I don't know about you, but for me, it's markably different. I get cut off and first of all, I have a huge response right away. It's like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? That was so dangerous. I'm probably swearing, I'm probably yelling. And then it doesn't even just stop there. You're still mad by the next light. You're annoyed at that person who had one job it was to watch for the turn signal to go and they sit there like an idiot. And then you're mad at someone else who's walking by and didn't walk quick enough across the crosswalk. And all of this overreaction, you have no ability to dampen it down because you don't have any food in the car. And that's a bit like that pain system is if there's no ability to make it less sensitive, it becomes very hard to regulate it. And then it starts to make sense, doesn't it? Why the amount of pain someone with osteoarthritis feels when they walk, maybe when you walk, it doesn't reflect merely what's going on in your joint or the amount of joint changes or tissue damage that are present. What it reflects instead is what is going on your, in your system as a whole and that increased sensitization. So let's, let's look at that in a different way and, and look how that actually relates to activity levels. So you may have seen this diagram before, I think possibly in Lorimer and maybe Cormac's talk as well. And this is at the Twin Peaks. And the idea behind this is that this mountain here is the amount of activity that we do. So this is for a healthy, pain-free person. So for anyone in the world, we all have a specific amount of activity that if we do more um, than that, we hurt ourselves. We all have a tissue capacity. But the key bit of this and the important part of our pain system is that actually we have a protect by pain line that comes on before we reach that tissue capacity. We all have this safety buffer. And this is a good thing because it alerts us to stop doing something before we might get injured. Now, this looks a little bit different in people who have osteoarthritis. So there are changes to the joints in osteoarthritis and that, that matter um, to, the, to the condition and, and to how much pain people feel. So it does mean that for people with osteoarthritis, it's quite possible that they do have a somewhat reduced tissue capacity, less activity before they might um, hurt themselves. But the key bit here is that what we see is that they have a much larger safety buffer. So think of all the changes that I was just talking about in terms of inflammation, in terms of the brakes and the accelerators being off. This creates a big safety buffer and the system itself becomes overprotective. But this is really important to understand because what it means then is that as we're starting to do activity, you might feel pain and it might be sore, but you're just pushing into that safety buffer. You're nowhere near tissue capacity, but because there's this expanded safety buffer, it hurts. So this tells us that actually when we're doing uh, movement, as long as it's reasonable, we can be sore, but we're safe because we're nowhere near that tissue capacity. What's important to also understand is I've talked about some of the changes that occur in the danger message that, that increase that safety buffer. But we also know that this overprotection can be heightened or maintained by lots of other things like beliefs, like fear, like anxiety, like sleep. All of these other things that I showed you in this diagram, knowledge, expectations, past experience, all of these things can be important to the experience of pain and can maintain that overprotective safety buffer. So the available evidence suggests that we don't, uh, the pain that we experience is not just a readout of what's going on in the tissues. And, but instead what we actually see is that we all have a dynamic system and that system adapts and it updates based upon the available information for that person in that environment, in that society. And ultimately what it's doing is weighing up the available evidence of danger against the available evidence for safety and determining, do I need to be protected? And actually if I, so if I have more evidence of danger than safety, I need to be protected. 
and pain is um, experienced or is increased. And this is a really important con uh, content and context to understand because ultimately what it means for you is that anything around you in your life that suggests that you need protecting or that you might be in danger can increase pain. And anything that suggests that you don't need protecting or that you're safe can reduce pain. So it becomes really relevant to then actually explore that in depth for you and look at your unique balance of what we call dim sims or danger in me's and safety in me. Things that might be contributing to your pain experience. So as some examples, this can be things that you feel. It can be, you know, what you feel like after you look at your knee x-ray, if it's really scary, that might give you evidence of danger. Or evidence of safety might be actually feeling strength, feeling how strong your thigh muscles are when you're doing a, an activity. It might also be things that you do. For some, actually knee exercises might provide evidence of danger because if you're worried that those might be damaging your joint, that can provide evidence of danger. But there's a star there because if we know exercise is one of the best things for us, Knee exercises can actually provide evidence of safety. I'm doing something good for my joint. It might be things you say. So wear and tear, that can provide evidence of danger, can't it? Versus wear and repair might provide evidence of safety. It might also be things that you believe. If you strongly believe surgery is inevitable, there is nothing that I can do to change this. That's a danger. It provides a danger in me versus having a thought that there are many ways to improve my osteoarthritis as a safety. It's places you go, doctor's office can be danger, you know, that terrible smell, horrible lighting. I find doctor's offices a danger in me. Um, or, you know, choosing to go to a dance class with your best friend, that can be a safety. It might be the people that you're hanging out with, that can all contribute. It can be an out-of-date health professional, a dinosaur, a nosy neighbor who you find incredibly annoying, um, or a safety can be actually an up-to-date health professional that helps you through your pain journey, having supportive family around. And it can also be things that are happening to you and how you're feeling. So if you're feeling depressed and anxious, that adds evidence of danger, whereas feeling happy and optimistic, that adds evidence of safety. Now, I would like to add one thing to here, and, and I'd like to you each of you to actually consider where you think this lies for you personally. And that's this, this idea of having my surgery delayed due to COVID. Many people, Australia included, and I'm sure in Scotland, with all of the different things going on with COVID means that many elective surgeries have been delayed or, or even canceled. And I want you to reflect on what does that mean for you? Does that feel that knowledge of if I've had my surgery delayed? Well, now now it's just putting things off. I can't I have to wait until I get this surgery before I can get on with my life and actually start to live because I need this surgery and that's the only thing that will help. That can be a danger. Whereas I might challenge you to consider this as an opportunity. Because what I'm going to talk about next are treatment options that have been shown to delay or even prevent the need for joint replacement surgery. So that having my surgery delayed due to COVID at the very minimum might mean you have a chance to take part in some of these treatment options. And worst case scenario, you're, you're fitter, more healthy uh, and more ready to undergo surgery should, should that be the course you take. Or best case scenario, you might be pleasantly surprised at how much you can do and what you're capable of. So let's talk through these treatment options. So we've, um, when reviewing the literature, we've uh, found that there are three key ingredients to taking the steps to recovery from osteoarthritis. And it's a bit like baking bread where you've got flour, water and, and yeast. Here, the three key ingredients for osteoarthritis 
are increasing knowledge, they're increasing activity levels, and they're decreasing inflammation. Now, I've already started you on the process of increasing knowledge. We've explored some of the new knowledge that we have about osteoarthritis that might make you have a think about actually maybe why you might be experiencing the things you, you are experiencing. But I want to delve into this a little bit further because there is even more to that. Because I really want to, to go through and, and, and impress on you how much your knowledge and your beliefs about OA actually matter. So first of all, we're starting to understand that actually your knowledge and beliefs about your body, they influence pain. So if we take people to the lab and we zap with them with lasers, but before we do this, we do a really thorough skin assessment on them to make sure their skin is resilient and robust and safe to receive a laser zap. And we air, look at some areas and we figure, yeah, totally safe. Skin is re uh, resilient, it's robust. But, you know, there's other areas that you know, maybe it's it's probably fine, but it's, we're not quite sure if it's safe. We'll just watch it carefully. And then if we zap you with lasers in different areas, what might you think happens? You probably may have guessed it, but you might not have known this. In these experiments, all that skin assessment, total lie. It's deception. In all cases, the skin is totally resilient and robust. But when people believe that it might not be safe, an identical laser zap hurts significantly more than if you zap the areas that they believe are totally safe. So things hurt more when you aren't sure that they're safe. And that's really important because when we hear information from someone that we trust, and that determines whether or not we think something's safe for us, for our body, that can have large influences on pain. Now, the thing is, is that we're often not aware that this is occurring. This is not often something that we have conscious control over. These are ways our system just adapts. So I want to give you another example of this to show you, you know, how compelling it is. And I'm going to show you a video. And on this video, you're going to see a girl in the middle of the screen and words on either side of her. Now, the sound in this video is quite quiet. So I'd like you to lean in crank up your, your volume knob um, and get ready to listen. But what I'm going to get you to do is I want you to read the words on the right hand side of your screen. You can say them to yourself or mutter them under your breath and then listen to what you hear. One more time. Brainstorm. What word did you hear? Hopefully you heard brainstorm. What I'm going to do again is I'm going to show you that video again, but this time I want you to read the words on the left hand side of your screen. Once more. Green needle. And just for fun. Brainstorm. Isn't that crazy? You will only hear the word you're reading. That's an identical audio clip. So basically what's happening here is you're priming your brain to expect a certain sound pattern based on reading that word. And that auditory signal, that sound, it was low quality and really noisy. So your brain tries to do the best fit and samples the things that it needs from that auditory, that sound signal and then matches it to what you're expecting and you hear the word that you're reading. But this is important because information coming from our body, from the danger detectors, from touch, from everything, it's noisy and there's a lot of it. We our brain cannot take in all that information. It has to sample and decide what information to take in. So you need what we need to think about then is that our beliefs and the words that we use can be priming our brain to selectively sample certain things coming from our body and can make things hurt more. So it's really important that we think about um, for health 
practitioners that are watching, the words we use for people who have osteoarthritis, the words you use to describe your osteoarthritis, they're important because they can prime your brain and change how you feel things without you even being aware. So these throwaway words like bone on bone or wear and tear, they're giving us this message that your body is damaged, vulnerable and fragile. When instead, and what is evidence-based, is instead of saying wear and uh, bone on bone, let's talk about the luscious lubricating fluid that you have in your joints. It's beautiful. It is the slipperiest thing known to man. We've never been able to recreate it. It sits there in your knee joint and basically allows things to move smoothly. And even if you, you see an x-ray where it looks like your joints are bone on bone, nothing is ever bone on bone. You always have this fluid in there. And instead of wear and tear, we've already talked about this, wear and repair. We want to give that message that your body is resilient and robust. There are also unhelpful words that can prime how you sample things that might be related to scans. You might have heard a health practitioner say to you, this is the worst x-ray I've ever seen. Or you've got the knees of a seven-year-old, which if you're 90, pat on the back. But unfortunately, often this is said to people who are 30 or 40 years of age, which that's terrifying. Because the message here is, oh my gosh, you should be worried how bad this scan is. Even a health professional that's seen so many scans thinks this bad is bad. But yet this is not supported by the evidence because actually what we see is that x-rays and scans, they do not tell us much at all about the amount of pain that you feel now, the amount of pain that you feel in the future, or how much activity you, you can do. Um, they do tell us about findings that are typically normal with age. So if we take people of the same age, but who don't have very much pain or any pain at all, and we put them into the scanner, they'll have similar findings. So many of these things are, are more like wrinkles on the inside. Now, this can be a bit hard to hear sometimes. I want to be clear. I am not saying that there isn't, you know, a contribution from, from a joint to the pain that you feel. There is. But scans are a little bit like a picture at a family reunion. If you see a picture of everyone smiling at a family reunion, do you assume that everything went perfectly? No, you know everything probably went terribly. There was someone who fought over the meatballs. What I'm saying is that a scan is limited. It is just a picture, so it doesn't tell us the whole story. And so we want to think of them a little bit more like wrinkles and knowing deep in our, in our belly that some of the scan changes are normal. But the critical thing is that they do not tell us what you're capable of. We see people who on a scan, they might be considered to have very severe osteoarthritis, but they do very well. You might have also heard unhelpful words about your future, like your joints wear out as you get older, or better get used to it, this will be here for the rest of your life. Giving you this message that, yeah, you're stuffed, just gonna get worse, you better be careful how much you do. But again, <laughs> this is not, not evidence-based, because what is, is this idea that we are bioplastic. You've heard this term before if you've watched the other, the other talks. It means that our systems can always adapt and change right up into the very end. And I want you to think deeply on this because this is exactly opposite of what many have been told about osteoarthritis, that it's just a progressive disease and surgery is inevitable. That is not the case. This is saying there is hope. You can have improvements for the better. Our systems are designed to adapt and change. Because a bit like the cuttlefish, we are all bioplastic. If we lift weights, we get larger muscle sizes and greater strength. If we practice a test, we get quicker reaction times. If we do weight bearing exercise, we get thicker cartilage and increased bone density. And our pain and immune systems are bioplastic as well. And one of the best ways to promote bioplasticity, to give it a push, is through exercise and activity. It's one of the best treatments for OA because it induces bioplasticity. We need something to give our system a little bit of a push so that it adapts and changes. And exercise, I mean, it just has so many good benefits, doesn't it? It helps increase self-efficacy and confidence. It improves our mood and quality of life. But here's what you might not know. Exercise decreases inflammation. 
So when you continue to do exercise over time, it produces things that are anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation. It also improves the breaks of your pain system. It helps decrease sensitivity. It improves cartilage health in people with osteoarthritis. It might help reduce body fat, which as you remember before, can also help reduce inflammation and reduce pain. And we know that slowly increasing your exercise over time helps reduce the overprotectiveness of the pain system. And this is important, even in people who have severe osteoarthritis. And I would argue that when we pair education with exercise, we get a double whammy because exercise helps you think better. It helps improve brain function, learning and memory. It helps you to be an effective learner. And I wanna just show you um, this aspect of it slowly um, decreasing the overprotectiveness over time. If we go back to, to these uh, Twin Peaks models, we have evidence to suggest that when we slowly but surely increase exercise over time, we can start to get improvements in tissue capacity, but we also see a reduction in this safety buffer so that you can do more and it hurts less. And so we have some nice evidence from a feasibility study that is promising towards the ability for things like education and exercise through a walking program to do this. Now, a key part of this that many people with osteoarthritis will say, and you might feel the same, is that, well, I don't know where to start. I don't know how much exercise to do. I don't know what's safe. And here's where I would really advise working with a health professional to find what we call your sweet zone. That's the amount of activity that's just right. It's not too much, it's not too little, it's just right. And typically it's the amount of activity that might be a bit sore while you're doing it, but the soreness and pain or swelling does not last for long after you've completed um, that activity. And for those of you that um, um, have, have done a little bit of work in this area before, have heard this message, you might also recognize that we can help things hurt less when we're exercising by reducing our dims, our danger in knees, and by adding or enhancing sims. Don't walk with that annoying person that you can't, can't stand. Choose to walk in nature, places that feel good, that make you feel happy, and with people that you love. Now, the last aspect is this idea of decreasing inflammation. I've already referred to the point that activity helps um, to reduce inflammation, but a key aspect of this is your diet. There's evidence to suggest that the Mediterranean diet, so things like olive oil, fishes, green vegetables can be helpful, but really I'd say the most important thing is trying to move away from processed foods, things that you buy already made wrapped in packages from takeaway places, um, and starting to, to, to try to go back to, to basic food groups. And one last thing that people might not um, be aware of as much is that your mood and your um, your uh, affect, how, whether you feel good or bad, that actually can influence your inflammation. So if you're feeling negative, that can increase inflammation. So taking part in a walking program, working with a health professional to find the things that work for you, feeling optimistic about that, that in and of itself can reduce inflammation. So I would argue that advice to move makes sense once one understands that osteoarthritis is a dynamic, low-level inflammatory process that involves nervous system, immune system, the gut, diet, adiposity, mind, past experiences, environment, the joints, the person. And all of this is marvelously bioplastic. So to summarize today, I hope you've come away with the idea that osteoarthritic pain is complex. It's not just about the joint. It's a low-level inflammatory condition and it has many contributors. And that complexity is a good thing. Many contributors means many treatment targets. We are bioplastic. There is hope for improvement. Education and exercise are some of the best ways to help induce bioplasticity, overtrain and over, uh, reduce a overactive pain system, reduce inflammation and encourage heart cartilage health. Strike wear and tear from our vocabulary. We now talk about wear and repair and keep in mind your three key ingredients to recovery, increasing knowledge, increasing activity, and decreasing inflammation. Just before we head to the panel, 
What I would like to do is just let you know about some research. This is um, Brian Pauline is a PhD student of mine who's doing some knee pain research, um, trying to better understand attitudes towards physical activity and movement. People with or without knee pain um, can participate. You have a QR code here and Richard will also share the link. Um, but that is the end of my time. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I'd like to turn it over uh, and join the wonderful panel Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Tasha. You, Tasha. That's, awesome. That's awesome. Uh, uh, we will move on to our panel. panel. I'm getting a bit of an echo of me back. I don't know whether it's um, with, could just go on mute, Tasha. That's brilliant, perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Some really positive um, comments coming in. We've got loads of questions. You'll notice in the question and answer panel, you can give questions a thumbs up. So we know the, the really popular ones to go to. If you have a burning question, get it in the question and answer box now while we introduce our panelists. So first of all, I'm gonna to come to Alistair Murray, who apologies, I just completely um, stumbled over some introductions at the beginning, but you are a, an orthopedic surgeon. I'll let you introduce yourself a bit further there, Alistair. Yes, hi, thank you and good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm Alistair Murray and, and as you've heard I'm an orthopaedic surgeon in Lanarkshire in Scotland. Uh, I also have a role as director of that service in Lanarkshire and a, and a further role over the last two years uh, as a chair of the orthopaedic um, community in Scotland. So that's uh, representing uh, the orthopaedic uh, clinicians across the country and obviously during what has been an extraordinary and difficult time. So I'm most grateful for the opportunity to contribute to today's webinar and hopefully provide some answers and input to the place orthopaedics services have. It's not just about surgery, but the services have in the management and help for people with uh, chronic pain from osteoarthritis and some of the, uh, the issues that we currently face about access to these treatments. Spot on, thanks Alistair. Greg, I'll come to you next, you're a GP. Yeah, so I'm a GP with extended role in orthopaedics. So I work between primary care and secondary care in Aberdeen. Uh, so I do clinics in orthopaedics and work as a GP. So uh, it's useful to have maybe a foot in both camps. Uh, part of my job in orthopaedics, we've got a kind of educational and link role to sort of improve the way that GPs can kind of help patient patients manage musculoskeletal problems. Um, so yeah, that's that's very rewarding and lots that I've learned today that we can take back to the to the GPs and um, also works at, uh, within sport um, among the roles. I'm a team doctor with Aberdeen Football Club and with the uh, Scotland national team in football. Thanks very much, Greg. Celia, I'll come to you next up in Edinburgh. And I'll just get you to come off mute, Celia. That's right. Hello everybody, um, my name is Celia Borland and I've li been living with persistent pain for almost two years now and I have osteoarthritis in my hip. I'm retired um, and having worked full time for most of my life, I was really looking forward to doing more of what was important to me, spending more time with my growing family and with my friends, doing some voluntary work that was related to the work that I did when I was working and um, walking, which has been my form of exercise. I just love being outside and outdoors and doing things there and spending more time at my allotment. And maybe having a few trips to some faraway places. But three months into lockdown, suddenly I um, had crippling pain in my hip and was kind of disabled and hoped that something would click into place and I'd get better, but actually I had to get um, help from my GP and got medication. And undoubtedly the pandemic influenced the path that I took to confirm my diagnosis and finally treatment. Um, <clears throat> it was a kind of long and winding road, but I did have a face to face consultation sort of 18 months on with my GP and I had an x-ray very quickly which came back saying that there certainly was arthritis in my hips and the thought was that maybe I would need to go towards thinking towards um, some um, intervention with surgery but my GP said I think you should be getting more activity because I've been cooling myself away at home and just doing little bits and that led me also because she said activity and what about some exercises Celia so 
I um, went to a physio and he has been a key support in the last five months in the way I've been looking at things. The first thing he did was listen to me and then he um, said, I want to show you this and he picked on his laptop and showed me the Flipping Pain website and he said, I want you to re see this one. And it was Tasha's previous um, talk on flipping arthritis. And that was a eureka moment for me. It changed the way I was looking at things. And um, I now I have a greater understanding about um, my pain. I'm much more active and I'm committed to those exercises that he's given. And I'm also more connected to my previous life and my sort of plans for, for my um, retirement. So accessing the flipping pain resources has really given me a framework to understand my pain and kind of spark my determination to put my not so best foot forward and um, explore whether there may be other options for my future treatment. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Celia. That's fab. Um, I will come finally to John, who is in Glasgow and also lives with persistent pain. Hi, um, I'm John and um, I've been suffering f with uh, pain from osteoarthritis uh, for the last oh, 35 years or so. I've had two back operations and three uh, knee joint replacements, which doesn't mean that I've got three legs. It just means that one of the, the joints actually failed. Um, but over time, my condition has deteriorated and um, Chronic pain began to take over my life uh, so that by the early, my early 60s, uh, I was taking several, several different pain medications uh, each day. And there was no way I was functioning normally. Um, but six years ago, I was fortunate to be accepted on the uh, NHS Glasgow Pain Management Programme. And that was a lifesaver. Uh, there, I learned to understand pain which is the first thing you've got to do, that it's not simple. Um, uh, I learned uh, how to improve my mobility and become much more active by careful management of that activity to teach my brain uh, again that I can do things without, without suffering uh, un unduly. I also learned tools that help me cope better um, with the uh, physical effects of pain and the psychological effects of pain. So now I'm able to live well with my pain. I undertake a lot of activities. I have an allotment too uh, and a large garden uh, and I volunteer with a, a, a heritage railway. So I've actually gone from being almost completely inactive to being very active again, which is quite a result. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Brilliant to hear. Um, so let's go on to some of the, the questions that we've had come in. Um, I think I'll put this one to Tasha to start with and then let's go to Greg and then let's go to um, Celia or John about your experiences with this. So Joe asks a great question. Are we saying people should just push through pain? And if we are saying, yeah, it's safe to push through pain, is there a limit to that? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. I think what we're not trying to do is to absolutely ignore pain and try to push through no matter what, because ultimately our, our system is a learning system. So often if we continue to just push through, ram through and have these boom bust cycles where you have lots of pain and then not, we actually sometimes can see that that causes increased sensitivity because it's like, well, actually, actually, every time you do this, you do way too much. So I need to limit you so that you don't do this. Um, but what we do see, though, is if we we almost call it nudging into pain. So if you have that discomfort, lower levels of pain when you're doing different activities that doesn't ramp up really high, doesn't stick around afterwards, it's sort of finding for you personally, working with your health professional or with a pain coach to determine the level of activity that it doesn't flare you. It doesn't mean that you get into that boom bust cycle of doing way too much and then being laid out for two or three days with swelling, with a lot of soaring, a lot of sore uh, knee or joint sore. So I think it's it's about finding that right balance um, for you, but it's not about entirely ignoring what you're feeling. 
that sense. That's brilliant. I will come to Greg on that. What would what was your advice to somebody who's coming to see you with that that question be? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose it's the, the first things are to kind of listen to the patient and be honest, I suppose. Um, acknowledge yeah, just as has been said before, that there's there's likely to be some discomfort, but maybe starting to maybe get the patient to think about grades of discomfort and is discomfort and pain the same thing and if we were to maybe start to think about it, if we were to reduce the pain a little bit would that be tolerable you know from the pain level that you're at just now do you think you would be uh, able to do what you'd like to do with a little bit of background discomfort knowing following some education that that's not a sign of damage so we'd be trying to maybe dispel some of those negative um, images um might be talking about uh, the, the reaction that they could have the next day and saying that, you know, if you're reflecting on that re reaction that you had, did, did you manage to achieve more function? You know, although there's been some discomfort or some pain the next day, did you manage to take yourself a little bit forward? What were the, the goals that you managed to, to make? And just the fact that you've done that, you've, you've managed to sort of increase your your self-efficacy, your, you know, your scope to kind of determine your own future with your uh, with your pain. And if we were maybe trying to then be a bit objective about what they could do to adapt it, we might think about just being, again, being really personal and, and making it a chat rather than a consultation. That's what I always try to do. And look at something that's modifiable. So the distance that they walked, where they walked, the number of reps that they maybe did, um, something that can be can be changed that they might be able to increase or decrease to keep them in a in that kind of sweet spot where they're getting benefit without too much of a negative reaction. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Greg. I'll put this this question to Celia and John as well. There's a, a very similar veined question um, from somebody who lives with pain to say, how do we push that? that safety buffer so when you are pushing through some discomfort when you are trying to increase your your tolerance of, of a certain activity what how do you manage that when it's a painful at the time or when it's painful afterwards oh. celia do you want to do you want to i'll come to you first with to talk about your experiences there if you want to come off mute and let us know yes i i i certainly think that i pushed myself a bit much at first um, because uh, I thought, right, I, I, I understand now I can work through this pain and then would find that maybe the next couple of days I was really quite limpy and, and, and hurtling around the place. So therefore I have learned to pace, to pace it. But one of the other things that I have discussed with my physio was um, that I felt so stiff and, and I think that therefore I have learned that I've also got to be quite committed to the exercises that I do um, to try and loosen me up and that has made a difference and it's taken a few months for that to sort of kick in but I've more recently found that I can go back and do a walk that I would have done before lockdown with ease and 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 had had just and been unable to do um when my arthritis kicked in it sounds like it is a a trial and error approach it it, it sounds like you don't get it right first time necessarily mm -hmm. uh, well and john i'll come to you with that that same question how have you managed to build up your tolerance of, of your walking and your gardening um, yeah, it, there are two words that are really important and, and uh, Celia used one of them, pacing, which means that you have to start any activity very gently and build it up uh, slowly so that what you're teaching your brain is that when you do more activity, it, it doesn't necessarily make the pain very, very much worse. If you push it on, then you get to boom and bust where you're actually reinforcing the fact that the more you do, the worse it gets. So you have to build up um, exercise um, very carefully and that's pacing. The other one is spacing. I mean, we've all a tendency to look at a job and think it's got to be done now and immediately and very quickly. So when you have to tackle something, one of the things to do is think of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And that means that you can split jobs up, do
do a bit now and do a bit later so that you're not pushing through that pain too much and causing boom and bust. The other thing I found really useful was a pain diary, which was recording your activity and recording what happened afterwards, the day, the next day or the day after. And that way you get, you have some feedback on what you're doing and how you're faring with, with pacing and spacing. And that was really, really useful. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Did that come with the pacing element and the spacing element? Does that come with an element of frustration to begin with? I imagine there is a, a feeling of, but I want to get this done today. You know, I've always been able to get this done in a day. Um, how much uh, how much uh, how much frustration do you have to deal with? And an element of acceptance comes along with that. Um, I, I think once you've got through the education part and understand what's happening with pain, that starts to become much easier because previously what you're living with is pain and frustration. Whereas if you can understand that there is a way through this, then it's much less frustrating. It does take time. I'm not going to pretend that it's not difficult, that it takes time, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a, some discipline to, to get through pacing and spacing until you can build up your activity. It's taken me um, years to do it and I'm still doing it. I can do more and more, you know, each day almost, just because I'm keeping pushing at the, the edges of what I can do. That's brilliant. Which Thanks helps psychologically. Yeah. It works both ways. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so really fascinating and interesting questions about swelling uh, that I, I want to come to. I'll come to you, Tasha, because I know you've done some research about joint shape and joint size. Um, so let's start with, can often people with arthritis have joint swelling. Uh, can increased pain sensitivity cause increased unneeded joint swelling? So we know the pain is almost an over response to the, the level of threat that there is. Is the swelling in that same category as, as being an over response? Yeah, really nice question. Um, so first of all, swelling can occur um, in that that is can be decently common in people who have um, osteoarthritis. Um, we do have some evidence to suggest that similar to pain, um, other aspects that are relevant to you as a person in your life, sensory information coming from that joint can influence swelling. So um, an example of this is we did a study where we used virtual uh, type of virtual reality to change how um, a person's knee looked to them. And what we found is that if we made their knee look bigger, it's the actual swelling of the joint increased. And if we made the knee look smaller, actual swelling of the joint decreased. So in this scenario, what we're seeing is that sensory information, so from vision about your body part, that seems to matter to um, the, the protective factor in terms of swelling and pain. So there is some evidence to suggest that um, aspects of swelling um, are protective like pain. Um, I think we it, it often becomes individual to the person as to when that swelling comes on for them, if it tends to be related to activity, what aspect of, of that swelling there is. But I would say that the available evidence suggests that, that it is protective. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And in terms of, of that swelling, how, how there is a question coming in here that can exercise help manage that swelling? I'll, I'll come to um, to Greg on that one. I think it. I think it can. Yes, overall it can. Um, I suppose maybe something that we need, we need to think about as well is that there are other causes of swelling too, not just osteoarthritis that we would need to think about. Um, these can be things like infection, gout, inflammatory types of arthritis too. So there, there's different roles for swelling and some of those are sort of exclusively needing medical input. Um, but yeah, with regards to sort of the physical activity side of it, um, yes, it can influence it positively in terms of when you're moving. We know that that can um, influence the factors that can promote uh, or increase swelling. But yeah, being realistic as well, we know that certain types of physical activity, um, particularly when we're shifting beyond sort of just physical activity and exercise into sport, where there might be unaccustomed or unplanned movements, there is the chance then that you can irritate a joint and cause some swelling there too. So it, both can happen. 
Joe. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, what I also want to come to is is talking about surgery, and uh, we've got Alistair here, who is an orthopaedic surgeon, as you touched on in in the presentation there, Tasha. A lot of surgery has been postponed. Joe, who um, has has commented in the chat, says hallelujah in, uh, to having surgery delayed. Hopefully, it won't ever be necessary, which is a which is a great approach and um, really positive to hear after after hearing the presentation. Are you seeing, Alistair? this happen? Is it possible that somebody could could make these changes who's on a waiting list for surgery? Um, and what would be your advice to somebody who is who is on a waiting list currently and, and perhaps struggling? Thanks. Yeah, and, I mean, yes, the short answer is it is possible. And we've heard this morning about things that can be done. And I think we have a, a very large role to play as, as healthcare professionals, Greg and myself and others, we're ensuring that patients understand what can be done whilst uh, whilst waiting for for surgery and you know today's event is a big step towards that a huge amount to learn i saw another question about educating healthcare professionals to avoid negative terms and to avoid negative reinforcement and these are other things we really must take forward so yes absolutely and we are we are trying to work as a group to to try and help patients understand what other possibilities there are and if somebody's symptoms improve then there's no inevitability about having to have a joint replacement operation uh, you know, the, the surgery is there to alleviate pain and hope primarily and hopefully improve function. But if that if that is achieved by some other route, then surgery doesn't need to be part of the solution. I think that's a really, a really pertinent point because often we have the X-ray and we go, oh, well, that X-ray looks like it needs surgery. Well, we've been told that. Um, we're actually what you're saying is the picture may not change, but your pain and your function might and therefore your need for surgery may change despite the picture looks exactly the same. Is that way is that about right? That's exactly right. I mean there, there are occasions sometimes where you know and for individual cases things may progress and change with different and I think the other thing to recognize is that we believe osteoarthritis is not one unique condition. It is a very, very complex situation and, and people are affected in different ways and there's different progressions within that. So it is very individual. But the basic sort of tenant is that if your symptoms are improving and you're managing your symptoms, then you know surgery may not be the solution for you and probably isn't at that point. Thank you very much. Um, Celia, I'll come to you. As you say, it was at the, the start of lockdown that your pain came on, that there probably wasn't time to, to get to a point where you were maybe being referred for, for surgery. Was it a worry that was on your mind? Is it something that, that is going to require onward referral? Definitely, definitely. And that's why I went to, to have a face to face discussion with my GP because I thought that's what needed to happen next. Um, and that was, I suppose, looking at what was happening with friends and family um, who might have had um, some. were on the waiting list for hip replacement. I had two friends who were on, 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 on the waiting list for hip replacements, but I hadn't seen anybody. So. So I definitely went to my GP with that in mind. She said, well, let's have an X-ray and I got the X-ray and I've got arthritis in both hips, but my right hip is perfectly fine and functioning. Um, but my left hip's the one that's given me drip. Um, so I. I'm, I'm, I'm in, and so I'm kind of intrigued that that sold me on what Tash had been saying about X-rays and scans. Um, because it, of, of that. But I am at the moment feeling that I don't need to be pressing to go and speak to an orthopaedic consultant at this time because I do feel that I am managing my pain. I can get lost in my activities now for, for long periods of time and not notice that I've had a limpy leg. Um, so I'm feeling, yes, that I'm I'm, I'm fine just now, but but if, but I may need that in the future, but it's a bonus because what I've been doing is having much more activity, walking a lot more than I ever was for the past 18, the previous 18 months um, and doing my exercises so I've got stronger back. So that can on, only be a good thing if I did require surgery in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Celia. And, and I'd like to ask John as well, has surgery ever been on the agenda for you? Uh, 
I've just, I, so you come off mute and now you're back on it, John. I don't know if you can just unmute yourself again. I'm not hearing you just now, John. But I'll, I will come back to you. Um, there was, um, Alistair, you touched on it just before. There was a, a really important question that continues to be echoed by healthcare professionals in the chat, um, which is, Clearly, this is different messaging to what we've heard before about arthritis. Clearly, this is very different. But we have, you know, bone on bone has been thrown around wear and tear. Uh, and we're saying, actually, maybe this isn't the most accurate thing. We also need to be educating the healthcare professionals so that this filters down to the, the next generation of people, the current generation of people with osteoarthritis. What are we doing about that? So let me come um, to both Alistair and Greg on that as healthcare professionals. Alistair, I'll come, I'll come back to you first on that. Well, I mean, it is it's an extremely important question, and I would I would think that most of us would confess to to falling into these traps at times because traditionally this type of language has been used, and, and that's why people are hearing it. I mean, the, the, the people who train tomorrow surgeons are are the existing surgeons today and clinicians today, so it starts there. And I think, uh, you know, spreading spreading the information that we've heard today amongst the healthcare professionals, we have our own educational events and annual meetings and other things, and this is exactly the type of type of uh, messaging that we need to be sharing amongst ourselves. We all realise that we're in a new era now, unfortunately, where people are waiting again extremely long time to see us or indeed then ultimately to have surgery. So we absolutely need to be making sure that we're getting our messaging right and positive reinforcement and explaining because I think a lot of what we can do is not just do the operation. It's about explaining to patients, offering reassurance where it's appropriate, letting people understand their situation and their and their um, pathology. Uh, because you know, speaking personally, you know, when I've had reassurance about something that I didn't fully understand, it does help you manage the pain. So it's absolutely true. So we've got a lot of work to do, but we do have mechanisms to 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 do it. Well. Greg, I'll come to you with that same question. Yeah, um, I think that sort of cognitive reassurance is, is really important. So it's, it's reassurance that's justified as opposed to kind of it, it's all going to be OK type of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, so we've done quite a few things in, in NHS Grampian with educating health professionals. So we've before COVID, COVID, uh, <laughs> We went out to practices and had sort of face to face se sessions with GPs, allied health professionals or nurse practitioners to educate and just to take the black marker pen through wear and tear if it was on their vocabulary. Um, so that's been a very consistent message. Um, when we get referral letters into orthopaedics, we try and use them a bit more dynamically rather than just say, here's an appointment. We'll sometimes get the referral and just phone the patient. So if the referral said, patient like to come in to discuss surgery well they probably don't need to wait a long time to come in to discuss surgery so I'll just phone them and if if it sounds like they might need surgery then I can give them some information and talk about what's involved in surgery and if if it seems that that's the plan I'll be the broad approach will be well let's get you as fit and well as you possibly can in advance of the potential surgery appointment um we've we then will go back to the GP with written information. If we're seeing the patient anyway, we might say, yeah, here's some things that you could do in primary care that mean that the patient doesn't need to come to see someone in the orthopaedic department. Um, I'll try and use clinic letters educationally as well. So I'll, I'm a real editor of my clinic letter. So I like to put things in bold and underline and so on so that they're useful for the GPs because I know the GPs will sometimes skim read them to make sure there's a kind of consistent, educationally valuable message. And um, again, I'll probably copy the letters often to patients as well, so that if the patient's not sure, they've got a copy of the letter and the GP, the surgical department and the primary and the patient can all be on the same page. So we all know what the next step is, but I sometimes like to leave a, a wee gap there so the patient has to kind of make the step after that themselves, just to kind of, again, encourage that capacity to, to self-manage. Excellent, brilliant. And of course, if you are somebody who's um, meeting a healthcare professional who's who's talking a, a different language to you now, maybe share this this kind of talk with them. Share the flip and pain resources. Share Tasha's research. Um, there'd be a, a step in the right direction. Um, 
we are coming to the the end of the of the session. I'm going to squeeze in one last question, which is one that comes up in um, if it's come up in our previous sessions as well. Let me come to to Tasha and then possibly John, if if um, if we can on on this one. What do we do? What do you do when you you're kind of doing everything right? You've you've got an active lifestyle. You've got a healthy diet. You understand pain. You you this all sounds very uh, familiar, but you're still living with pain. You're still living with some swelling. What would be your advice to somebody who's in that situation, Tasha? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I think there there are situations, and um, uh, Al referred to those a little. Is that osteoarthritis? It is. It, it's a very complex presentation. So there sometimes are cases in which things like surgery is indicated, um, and we explore that fully with people. But usually, what I would also say when we have a situation like that is to to dive deep into, into what we've called activity, what we've called good diet, and, and also diving deep into the various contributors individually for that person's life that might be influencing things. Because I think sometimes we can have a tendency to silo off different areas where these are the things that are relevant to my knee, but actually the fact that I'm struggling at work or something like that. Well, that has no impact on my knee because, well, it's just work. I'm not exercising while I'm at work. Sometimes sitting down, I think, with a, an experienced pain coach or a health practitioner, professional, to really delve deeply into some of those things is quite important because what we might see is that things that might we might not anticipate are actually influencing what we're experiencing actually are playing a really large role. And if we can mitigate some of those things or if we can power up some safety in me's and, and have strategies in place for some of those bigger issues that we might not be able to change, um, we can actually see really good results. We've, um, in our pilot study where we were running um, a pain science education um, and a, a walking program, we had someone who was caring for um, a partner that was undergoing at first stages of dementia, but actually going down quite quickly. And for that person, that is a danger in me and a, an aspect that right now you can't change. But then it's trying to deal with all of the other things to help power up other positive things to try to to kind of balance out those those messages. And, and that actually was helpful. And I'm not saying that that is necessarily the case for everyone, but I think that many times really sitting down and going thoroughly through your plan with someone can be really helpful um, in, in, in seeing if there's benefit from some of these strategies. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tasha. John, if if um, if you can, I'll come to you about, have you had days like those where you feel like you're doing everything right, but but you still have pain, have, have anything to, to add to that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, you, you have good days and bad days. Um, and I think sometimes that's because if you think about it, sometimes if you're not feeling right and you're, you know, you're angry or you're upset, then that can affect your pain. So you've got to be aware of all of the things that affect your pain. I think one of the biggest barriers to, to actually living well with pain is to, is to expect a magic bullet. That, that fixes things, either surgery or medication. I think a lot of patients start off, and I did, looking um, for something which would just make it all go away. And that's a barrier, uh, I think, to moving forward. The, the, I, you asked earlier, and I couldn't answer, um, has op ha had surgery loomed its head? Yeah, well, I've had five operations to try and fix things before I went on a pain management course. Um, so I know that, that that looking for the magic bullet is is not a waste of time, but it can be a barrier to actually getting to the point which you need to be, which is understanding exact, exactly what's happening to you, and then figure out for you. And it's a very individual process. Everybody is different. Everybody is unique. So. There are a variety of tools that you have to learn, understanding all the tools about sleep and psychology um, and use the ones that work for you. It's like a tool bag. Take out the tools that you need and then you can start to get your life back and, and live better. Um, and I just wish I did pain management uh, 30 years ago rather than 
you know, surgeries and, and so on to try and fix things and lots of medication. So pain management is a lifesaver. It really is. Thanks so much, John. Thank you for sharing your experiences there. And uh, and that, I think that's a, a great place to wrap up as well. Uh, so I want to, to thank Professor Tasha Stanton for her, her time, which is probably ticking on into the night now in Australia. So thanks so much. Thank you to all the panellists, to Alistair, Greg, Celia and John, and to all of the team working behind the scenes on the webinar as well. What you'll have just seen pop up on your screen is a QR code. So if you hover your phone over the, the camera, uh, part of your phone over that QR code, it will take you to the survey. And if you have any problems accessing that, the link is also in the um, in the chat and the Q&A box. Uh, you can also find a full list of our resources on the website. That's also in the in the chat um, in the in the Q&A box. And you'll also see the telephone helpline here. So if you are in Scotland and you are on an NHS waiting list to a paid service, there is a free helpline set up by our friends at the charity Pain Concern. You can give them a call or drop them an email and they're offering support and advice while you wait for your appointment. You can also check us out on our social media at Flip and Pain across the board there. You can look at our website flipandpain.co.uk which has a whole host of, of other resources. You can also watch Tasha's previous webinar that Celia mentioned um, that we did last year. You can re-watch that there. Um, and if you want to email us some additional feedback, please do. We're at info at flipandpain.co.uk. Again, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon um, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.